Antonio, if, if you want, if you can start your conference. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, uh, my name uh, is everybody listening me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, uh, my name is Antonio Ramirez, and I will present this talk uh, named Power Diagnosis in this Treatment System. Uh, The agenda for today is the following. First, I will introduce you some basic concepts about uh, fault diagnosis and about uh, Petri nets. In this case, I will use Petri nets to present uh, these Petri net systems. Uh, in the next part, I will show you uh, some structural conditions uh, for uh, the fault diagnosability property in these Petri nets and also in time continuous Petri nets. Also, I will show you how to design diagnosis uh, for this petrinet and also for the time continuous case. Uh, next, in the next uh, part, uh, with one slide, I will show you how to build distributed diagnosis and at the end, my conclusions and further remarks. Uh, I, I would like to convey, to convey in this, uh, during this talk that uh, petrinet is a good tool, tool to model these petrinet systems and also to characterize uh, in a polynomial way the fault diagnosis property and also to build diagnosis for these treatment systems. Okay, uh, this is the, my problem. In this case, uh, the diagnosis based on the model, uh, based on the model has the following assumption. The following assumption is that I know the, the model of the system and also I know the set of potential faults that could occur do, during the system execution. I have, have the following definition. A fault occurs when the system behavior deviates from the normal behavior. But in this case, the output of the system uh, continues meeting the requirements of the system. For example, it continues meeting the number of parts that it, that it can produce per unit time. Also, it can uh, continue uh, producing the variety of parts that this uh, System must uh, reach, and when a false, uh, when a failure occurs, then again the system behavior deviates from its normal behavior. But in this case, the system of the output uh, cannot meet uh, its specification. In this case, the throughput is uh, reduced. Maybe the number of uh, the variety of parts that this system is producing is also reduced. I have the following definitions. In this case. Uh, all diagnosis is uh, is composed of these three uh, three stages: fault detection, fault location, and fault estimation. In the case of the fault detection, this this stage is focused on detecting detecting a fault. It means when uh, the system deviates from its normal behavior. And then fault location is uh, focused on determining which faults occur during the uh, inside of, into the system. And finally, fault estimation. Uh, determines the magnitude of the fault. In this talk, I will address in these two problems, the fault diagnosis problem and how to de uh, design a diagnosis. In the fault diagnosis problem, I, uh, the assumption is that I know the system, also the model of the system, of course, uh, the initial state of the system, the system input and output, and the set of potential faults that, are, uh, that could occur during the system ex ex execution. And my problem is to diagnose a fault. It means to detect, locate, and estimate the fault during the system execution. And it's supposed that I the, the diagnose this fault in a finite uh, number of events after the occurrence of this fault. For example, this system is executing uh, its normal behavior here, and a fault arri uh, arises or occurs here. And then, in a final number of events, like this in key K events, I will be able to detect, locate, and, and estimate the fault. In the part of the design of the diagnosis, I will uh, I will will uh, design a device or an algorithm that knows the model of the system and also the input and outputs of the system, and this is able to to detect, locate, and estimate the fault. 
this uh, diagnosis is running in parallel with the system. What is a discrepant system? Okay, it is a dynamic system. It means that the behavior of the system depends on the input of the system and also on an internal quantity of the system that we know as the state. And in, the, in this kind of system, the state space is numerable and also the states change abruptly, abruptly when an event occurs. For example, in this case, this system is evolving and this is the state of the system. And when this event arrives, then the state changes abruptly to this new state. Uh, here, the paradigm of differential equations cannot be used to model this system because, as you can see, the derivative of this state uh, doesn't exist. So instead of that, we use another kind of formal tools such as finite automata, petri net, process algebra, Boolean algebra, and many others. In this presentation, I will use petri net because they capture uh, all the characteristics of this, this discrepant system, such as uh, causal relationships, uh, mutual exclusion, uh, synchronization, concurrence, etc. And also, the models that I obtain using this tool, these models are very compact. What is a petri net? Okay. A petri net has two components. One is the petri net layout or graph, and the other part is the mapping the net. Uh, here I am presenting uh, different kinds of petri nets, uh, distant continuous and time continuous petri nets, and all of them share the same petri lay net layout or graph. This petri net layout or graph is composed of places that are represented by these circles transitions that are represented by this bar, yeah? and the, the number of these places is finite, and also the transition, the number of transition is uh, finite. There are arcs joining places with transition and transitions with places, but there are not arcs joining places with places or transition with transition. In this case, the weight of the arc joining places with transition is coded in the pre and function, and the weight of arcs joining the transitions with places is coded, is coded in the post uh, function. As you can see, you have the same graph for all the petri nets, for all the families of different uh, kinds of petri nets. These are continuous, tiny continuous petri nets. Even if you use a stochastic petri net, it's also using the, the same graph. In this last case, case in tiny continuous petri net, we have these positive numbers that are associated to the transitions. And in this case, it is number is the transition firing rate, and it represents the number of times that this transition can be fired per unit time. We also have this uh, matrices. In this case, uh, the, mat mat the entry IJ of matrix three has this entry has the weight of the arc joining place PI with transition PJ, and uh, the entry IJ of, matri of matrix post has the weight of the arc joining transition TJ with place PI. And finally, the incident matrix of the net is uh, computed as the difference of these two matrix, post minus three. Using only this petri net layout or graph, uh, using this, we can define several structural objects. It's, it is important because these uh, structural objects can be computed in polyno polynomial time and they can be used to characterize many properties of the petri nets, in this case, the property of uh, uh, diagnosability. Uh, a PCME flow is uh, a vector that belongs to the left kernel of the incident matrix, and the entries of this vector are positive or zero. A PCME flow is a vector that belongs to the right kernel of the incident matrix, and also the entries of this vector uh, are positive or zero. A trap is a set of places such that the set of uh, output transitions is included in the set of input transition of the net. This is a, a, a graph that is representing a trap. You can see that they have more input, this is an input, than output. And a siphon is a set of places also, but in this case, the set of uh, input transitions is contained in the set of output transition. Like this case, uh, I have this one is an, an output transition now. A net is consistent if uh, there exists a vector that belongs to the right kernel of the system, and this vector, all the entries of this vector are positive. And the net is conservative if there is a 
Direct CT spectrum that belong to the left kernel of the incidence matrix, and this vector, uh, the entries of this vector are positive also. Okay, now uh, the marking. The marking is the other object that uh, comes also to the Petri net. When I have the Petri net layout and the marking, then I will say that I have a Petri net or a system. Uh, the, the marking uh, changes a little bit depending on, on the kind of uh, the petri net that I am using. For example, in this case, in this in this discrete case, these markings assign to each place a non-negative integer number. And in this case, in the other two cases, this marking is assigning to each place a non-negative real number. Okay, this transition in, a, in the case of a discrete, uh, in the discrete case, in the discrete Petri nets, a transition is enabled if all the input places to this transition have tokens and the number of, of number of tokens inside inside each place is greater uh, or equal to the weight of the arc that is joining this place with the transition. In the other case, uh, we need to define the enabling degree. In this case, the enabling degree is computed but by, by like this, the minimum value of this uh, operation. And this represents the marking the, of the input places of the transition divided by the weight of the arc that is joining with transition. Here, a transition is enabled if this uh, enabling degree is positive. Okay, there are some examples here. This transition in the discrete case is enabled because uh, the weight of the arc that are joining P1, P2, and P3 are represented in this vector is 1 for P1, 1 for P2, and 0 for P3 because there is no arc joining P3 with P1. And the marking of these places in P1 is 1. As you can see, this entry is greater or equal to this one. This is also in, uh, greater or equal to this one, and so on. So uh, this vector is fulfilling this. this for all the entries of this vector, so this transition is, is enabled. In the other cases, <coughs> the transition uh, is enabled if this number is positive. In this case, for example, uh, I have two places that are input places to P1, and the first one has one token, and the weight of this arc is one. So it's one token divided by the weight of the arc. In this other cases, uh, case, P2 has two tokens, and the weight of the arc is also one, so I have these two values, and the minimum is one. This number is positive, the transition is enabled, and uh, this number uh, is computed from the marking of P1. It's obtained because this is the minimum value that I have here. So in this case, I will say that P1 is constraining the enabling degree of P1, or that P1 is constraining P1 for sure. Uh, also, in the time continuous Petri net, I have this configuration matrix. This configuration, configuration matrix has as many rows as transition exist in the system in the Petri net, and as many columns as uh, places exist in the Petri net. For example, in this case, I have only one transition. Then this transi this matrix has only one row, and uh, it has three columns because I have three places. All the entries are zero except one. One. And this one uh, represents the place that is constraining the firing of the transition P1. The number that I put here is the inverse of this uh, weight, of the weight of this arc. If I change a little bit the initial marking of this net like this, then the enabling degree for, for this net is now 2. And it indicates that place 2 is the one that is constraining P1. So my configuration matrix is going to change to this one. Yeah. In this case, P2 is the one that is constraining this transition. And also, again, this number is the inverse of the weight of this arc. Enabled transitions can be fired, and uh, when they are fired, the marking of the net changes. For example, in the discrete case, when P1 is, uh, is fired, then it removes one token from the input places and, add one to and adds one token to the output places. And the new marking or the original marking will be this one. You can compute it uh, with the fundamental equation of the Petri net. And uh, here, this is the fundamental equation. And if you substitute the numbers, uh, for example, this has uh, two input arcs and one output arc. This is the incidence matrix of this net. You can uh, 
make uh, the expression fields and you will obtain this matching that is this matching. No? This is matching that uh, are adding zero tokens to P1 and one token to the other two. In the continuous and time continuous, uh, in the continuous uh, case, I have this uh, fundamental equation. It is the same, exactly the same, but in this case, I am accepting real numbers and I can uh, for the marking and also I can fire P1 in a real number. For example, in this case, I am firing P1 only 0.5 times. So I will reach uh, this match. Finally, in the time continuous stating net, I have a state equation, and this is the state equation. I can take this like this. And as you can see, this matrix, the compression matrix, is changing. So it is a positive switcher linear system. Uh, I made the simulation for this net, and this is uh, how the marking is evolving. Uh, if I put all the possible reachable markings uh, that this net has, I will obtain the reachability set of this net. I am putting this, uh, all these uh, nets, I am embedding this, uh, these reachable markings in this three-dimensional space because I have three plates. Also, in the continuous, I can, in the tiny continuous setting net, I can compute this uh, set of reachable markings. And as you can see, this set is the convex curve of this other set, of the, uh, the, the reachability set of the disk case. Uh, using Petri nets, I can model systems. For example, in this case, I have this tank, uh, I have some bands, but I will pay attention only to the level of this liquid in this tank. Uh, this level has three different values, uh, called the empty, medium, or large, or high. Uh, and when I open this valve, uh, the liquid is introduced to this uh, tank and the level will be increased. When I uh, close this valve, then since I have an extraction, extraction field, then the level will be reduced. So I identify that I have two elements that are uh, collaborating in the dynamic of this system, the valve and the tank. So I have this valve and I have this tank. Then I need to de define the state variables of each device. For the valve, I have the posi position, and for the tank, I have the level. And then I need to define the difference values that these uh, state variables can take. For example, the position of the valve can be open or, or is open or closed. That's all, only two. And the level, as I told you before, is empty, uh, medium, or high. Then, using this information, I will build these tables. As you can see, there are many as many rows as different values as the branch, and as many columns as different values as the branch again. And I will put this one because I can uh, go from this uh, state to this state in a single step. Then uh, I will uh, draw or define these petri nets. Uh, how many places this uh, state variable has? Well, it has as many places as different values has here. So it has two different values, open and closed. Then I have these two, two places. And I will put this transition because I will add it because I can go from close to the open uh, state uh, in a single step. I do the same for the other ones in these tables, and I will obtain two different petri nets that are separated, representing each one the state variable. Then using these, uh, these operators or these operations, I will build a monolithic, monolithic model for the system. In the synchronous computation, the transitions representing the same activity are merging into a single one. And in the permissive composition, for example, in this case, the transition, I can move from the empty state to the medium state only if the, if the valve is open. So I need to put these two arcs. It is the same for the other transitions. And in this case, also I have two arcs, but when I draw one arc and I put the other, this other one, this other arc was overlapped with the previous one, so it seems like one arc, or there are two arcs there. So, and using this methodology, I will obtain the normal behavior of the system, and I will add this kind of faults. For example, I found that in, it is interesting for me is this one. This case, uh, when the valve is closed and occurs this fault, it means that this token moves from this to this plate, and it says that the valve is closed, but it's stopped at this place because if you try to fire this transition in order to open the valve, it will be impossible because the token is not here, is there. Yeah. So in this case, the valve is uh, stopped. 
So once I have the model with the potential set of faults that could occur in the system, then I want I will analyze the property of foul uh, diagnosability in this pertinence. First, I will re recall that this um, fault diagnosis also was uh, studied in uh, using an automata representing the discretivian system uh, as an automata. This work, I think, uh, the first one was uh, uh, reported by Mara Sampat and Stefan Laforte in 1995, I think. And in this case, they have several activities, several events. And some of these events are not measurable. There are not sensors that detect uh, when these uh, events are activated. And some others have a sensor. For example, in this case, I am reporting these two, two sequences, and I am, I am assuming that alpha is not measurable. Also, the faults are not measurable. Uh, for example, in this case, the first uh, sequence is when I find beta, then alpha, then delta, and gamma. You can see that gamma is a cycle, so that's the reason that I'm using the screen operator here. Uh, the other case, the other sequence is when I find beta, then both alpha, uh, delta, and gamma. As you can see, both sequence produce the same uh, sequence of sensors. So if I pay attention to the sensor, that is the only information that I have, then I will not be able to determine if there exists a fault or not, because uh, both uh, sequences give me, uh, both sequences, when it has a fault or not, gives me the same se uh, sequence of sensors. Okay. Then I will study this problem, but using Petri nets. Why I am changing to the Petri nets? Because when the problem, this is a small problem, but when the problem has not so many, but maybe 20, 70 machines, for example, eh, and they can be idle or working, then I will have this quantity of states. And if you tr try to draw this automata or try to put into a memory of a computer, you, you are going to see that uh, you don't have enough space to represent this. This model is not, not so compact. But when I use Petri nets, I will obtain very compact models. So, I will study pettiness to determine when this uh, when this net, net exhibit the property of uh, fault diagnosability. Uh, this is the matrix of sensors. There are three sensors A, B, and C. So I have three rows: A, B, and C. And sensor A is uh, associated to place one, like this. Sensor B, the second row, is associated to place three, and sensor C is associated to place four. Okay, when I multiply three, uh, this matrix five times uh, the incident matrix, I will obtain this matrix. Since all the entries of this uh, matrix are different from each other and different from zero, then for sure that using only the information of the sensor, I will be able to detect which transition was fired. For example, in this case, when I fire transition T1, the, the first column, it is telling me that uh, the, the, this is the only transition that will turn on sensor A, and this is the case. When this uh, transition is fired, then I will turn on sensor. And when I fire the transition T2, is the only transition that will simultaneously will turn off sensor A and sensor C, and so on. So using the information that, of the sensor, I will be able to detect which transition was fired, and testing if these transitions, if these columns are different from each other or different from zero, it's very uh, easy, a polynomial uh, problem. Now, if I expand from this net, uh, this Richard EP graph, uh, I will uh, notice that if I have this uh, initial matching T2, P5, T2, P5, then I can find T4 and then T3, and I will uh, develop in this cycle. And as you can see, that I am turning off the sensor B and then turning on the sensor B. If a fault uh, occurs when I stay in this marking, then uh, this token will be removed from place T5, so I will move from this state to this other state. In this state, I have a fault because F1 was fired. And as you can see also, you can continue firing this T flow. So you have this T flow, and also you have that the sensor B is to get off and this is to get off. So I cannot distinguish which cycle is being fired in this case, so I cannot distinguish if there exists a fault or not. So the system is not diagnosable. If I do that, 
uh, I mean expanding the reachability graph, I will return, return to the problem of the uh, uh, finite automata. I will have uh, a large number of st state keys here, a very few uh, number of states. So the idea is to avoid this, uh, the construction of this uh, reachability graph because doing that, you are going to real in an empty complete drawing. So in order to avoid that, we need to pay attention to the structure of the net of the Petri net. In this case, this net is uh, uh, consistent and conservative. And this vector is all positive as the conservative part of the net. Then I will compute the TCM flows that con minimal TCM flows that contains P5. And these vectors are included in this. So computing this vector that is computed also polynomially, uh, I will obtain this vector. When this transition is added, these uh, two places becomes a siphon. So when the fault occurs, these transitions cannot be fired, fired anymore because there are no tokens inside of this plate. And also all the TCM flows that are related with these two transitions will be blocked. In this case, the TCM flow is T1, T2, and T5. And as you can see, if you fire T1, and then you arrive to this backend, and you cannot fire any, any other transition. So uh, when a fault occurs, all these uh, transitions will be blocked. But this other TCM flow that doesn't contain this transition, is independent of this transition, can be fired infinitely often uh, with the independence of uh, the occurrence of this fault. So this net is not diagonal saddle because there exists such TCM flow. As you can see, detecting or computing all these steps uh, can be done in polynomial time, so we can detect when the net is diagonal saddle or not. This is for the case of discrete Petri nets. And now how to design a diagonal set for this, car, for this case. Uh, here I have the system represented by these uh, Petri nets. In this case, I remove the, this uh, TCM flow, so this net is diagonal saddle. So I can, I can build a diagonal set for this uh, net. Here is another Petri net with one place, and I need to compute how it is connected to the other transition. This is the closed loop uh, form for this net with uh, the system and the diagonal set. And I have this residue to compute uh, when this, the system has a fault or not. When this residue is equal to zero, then for sure that the system is evolving in the normal behavior. And when it is equal to, is different from zero, when, when it's equal to zero, this is evolving in the normal behavior. And when it is different from zero, then there is an error here. Yeah, that's the idea. We are going to design this diagonal set like this. So if you pay attention, I am saying that uh, this, uh, this multiplication, this uh, residue will be equal to zero for all the normal behavior of the system. So it means that this vector is a p-flow of the net. And the p-flow of the net can be computed like this, multiplying this vector by this matrix. This matrix is the incident matrix, but only considering the places with sensors. In, in this case, the sensor is place one and place three. So they are the row one and the only this, uh, this, uh, this part of the incident matrix and must be equal to zero. Here I have two, one equation with two variables, B and X, but as you remember, this net is uh, even detectable. So all these uh, columns are different from each other. So I can consider that these uh, numbers belongs to a particular coding. Uh, uh, I can make uh, like, uh, different numbers that are coded in, in a particular basis. In this case, I have three different symbols, so I will, I will choose three. And this is the basis for this uh, for the codification of these numbers. So using this, I have solved this, uh, this, uh, this value. I found our value of B. And now I can compute these uh, other values. These are the other values that I require in order to that this multiplication be equal to zero. So it is telling me that transition one it uh, adds one token to the diagnosis, and this is this case, transition one, one adds this token to the diagnosis. Transition two removes four tokens from the diagnosis, and this is the case. Okay, it's removing when T2 is fired, it will remove these four tokens and so on. And the initial marking of this net is computed uh, also with the residue, and you multiply this, the flow times 
the, the initial marking. And the initial marking is only the marking of the sensor. In this case, sensor A is equal to zero and sensor B is equal to one. So the only one value that I need to compute is this one. And in this case, the model is equal to three. With this, I have the design of my di diagnosis. Here is uh, how the diagnosis works. Uh, maybe the, the, when the, there are no faults, this the residue is equal to zero. But when I have a problem here, for example, I try to fire T2 and uh, it fails from the firing. So I will have the following. If I try to fire T2, I will assume that uh, the diagnosis doesn't fail. So the four tokens are removed from the PD. These four tokens are removed from play. However, these tokens are not removed from play one and place two, three, because T2 was not firing. If I multiply this vector times the marking, I will find that the residue is equal to four. So uh, if I search in this uh, transition in the last row, this value, the absolute value, value uh, the absolute value, four, I will find that the problem occurs because T2 was not firing because it's negative. But not fire. So I am detecting the fault and I am locating the fault. So it is a good di diagnosis. Okay, let's move to the time continuous petri net case. In this case, I have this um, this net, and I will pay attention only to these uh, paths. In this part, the last the last place have a sensor. Also, the initial uh, places have sensor, and the transitions has only one input place. And there are places with faults. If uh, there are places that uh, have this kind of transition where tokens are removed from this path, then the, these places uh, must be measurable. Also, if they are adding tokens, these places must be measurable. So, using the differential, differential equation of the continuous petri net, then I will obtain this equation. Yeah. And as you can see, for example, in this first one, uh, you know the marking because you have a sensor, you have, you know the marking M5. And if you know this, then you know the derivative of this uh, number, yeah, of this signal. Because the only signal that I don't know is M4. So I can compute M4 from this equation like this. Also from the next equation, I can compute M3. And I move uh, downstream uh, in this part until I arrive to this place, the place that has the fault, in this case, uh, this is the equation, and as you can see, I have this unknown value and also this unknown value that represents the fault. Uh, I will compute from this equation the fault like this, but I cannot compute because I don't know M3. Uh, from this equation, I will obtain the derivative of this equation. Since the faults are constant, then I will obtain this equation, and I can compute from here M dot. I will obtain the, the derivative, and I will obtain M dot. So from this equation, I obtain uh, M dot. And from the last equation, I will obtain M2. And now I return to this equation and I can compute the magnitude of the fault and also the fault. So I am locating and estimating the fault again, and I have the uh, diagnosis for this case. And one problem that I found uh, is that in the literature, they analyze the language of the system. And they say, for example, that in this case, this net is uh, not diagnosable because there exists uh, this. Uh, the, uh, is in flow that can be fired infinitely often. Yeah. And I will not be able to detect the firing of the transition uh, of the faulty transition. But when I apply this to a real case, I found that I can uh, detect the fault. And the reason is the following one. I have these two state variables and they are evolving in parallel. So the this uh, this, this uh, state variable will be evolved even if this uh, transition is making this uh, PCME flow. So when a token arrives here, and it, uh, a token will be uh, arrive here, will arrive here, when just two transitions are fired, either because I use this path or this other path. So in a final number of time, uh, of events, so, sorry, uh, uh, this uh, sensor will be turned on. So if sensor B was turned on also before, then for sure that there is no fault. If I see sensor C but not B, then for sure that this faulty transition was fired and the fault is detected. Yeah. But uh, using 
this decomposition into piscine flux is not enough in on those three cases, and it's better to use the quotient petri nets. In this case, I have a very similar net, but these nets have more information. For example, it is telling me that if I try to fire T2, I need to fire T1 that belongs to the other uh, uh, equation. And also, it is telling me that there exists this TCM flow in the other state equation that can be fired infinitely often without firing this transition. So I have uh, more information. And when I apply this, um, this uh, foul diagnostic field, uh, I will find that this net is diagnostable. Uh, when I remove this sensor, then I could think that when I see that uh, this sensor A is turned off, then I will be able to detect the fault because uh, when it's turned off, I only pay attention if sensor D was uh, turned on before or not. But this is not true because uh, it requires that T1 uh, is fired for that first. I need to fire T2, T1 and then T2. And from the question of the net, I know that there exists this TCM flow, this one. So in this case, T1 can be fired, but only if this TCM flow is not uh, executed, but we are not sure of that. Of that. So T1, the, I cannot be sure uh, the number of events that occurs before the fire of T1. So in this case, this number could be infinite. In this case, the net is not diagnosable because in order to fire T2, I need to fire T1, but uh, maybe uh, an infinite number of events will be occurring in this TCM flow. So <clears throat> it is easy also to detect uh, faults or to check if the net is diagnosable, even if we consider the concurrent case. Uh, just a, a some slides to say that Computing the quotient nets uh, is a very easy task. Also, is supported in the literature, and we need to compute this matrix. But this matrix can be computed from the, this net that we call the annihilator, and there are the piscine flows of this annihilator. So it is com com computed in polynomial time. Okay, just uh, to end this, uh, if I have this uh, net, uh, I can build a distributed diagnosis just by computing the the equation petri nets of each state variable, and then I can design a diagnosis for each state variable. So I will obtain a distributed diagnosis for this case. Well, my conclusions and further remarks are very short. Uh, in this case, uh, I will tell you, I would like to say that these specific systems are widely used uh, in human activities. For example, in production systems such as flexible manufacturing system, transport system, logistics, etc. So they are very important. And also the early detection of faults uh, prevents the system from hazardous situation. So we can avoid hazardous situation for human operators, for the environment itself, and also for the system. Yeah? The system will not be broken if we take some actions uh, about these faults that we have detected. So we cannot avoid economic losses also. Uh, I will try to show you, I, I mean, try it to show you that Petri nets is a formal tool that can be used to model this, uh, this Petri -net system and to characterize the diag diagnosability property and also to design diag diagnosis for this, this Petri -net system. And also that the concurrence, uh, it is important to consider uh, concurrence in this kind of language and also we can characterize this property in this case using petri nets. As an open problem, uh, well, all the characteriz characterization that I showed uh, show, uh, you before uh, are only sufficient conditions that I am presenting. We don't have a, a, a enough a necessary conditions. So we need to do a lot of work in order to obtain better characterization than this one that I presented you before. So that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you very much for, for your plenary talk, Dr. Antonio Ramirez Treviño. And if anyone has any question, for Dr. Antonio Ramirez, 
for the, those present in the auditorium physically or through teams, please ask in this moment. I have a question. Uh, Sorry, Sandra, you have a question. Okay, I'll go back to the TDA. Okay. Uh, which one? This one. Yes. Uh, in the first, the other, uh, you said uh, sensor C was removed. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what is exactly this idea? Because because I understand uh, the 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 quality nets are computed, but, but but sensor C was removed. What, what is the principle? It's, it's just an example to say that, uh, that we need to, to do some job. It's not so, so naive the, the idea of uh, detecting the fault. I just pay attention. There is a, an echo here. Okay. The idea is this. Uh, if I only put this example, maybe the, the people can think that is very easy to check uh, the diagnosability, just paying attention to the quotient penetry net of each state variable. But it is not the case, but because there exist cases like this, and like this is another example where sensor C was removed, just to just an example, just to say that this, the information of this uh, quotient penetry net is not enough. I need to pay attention to the other state variables, and I need to pay attention if there exists infinite sequence that can be fired in the other uh, the other uh, state variable before the firing of this uh, transition. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, Antonio. You have any... okay. Thank you very much for your plenary uh, lecture. Uh, perhaps uh, and here there are some students from the mechatronic sections. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, you have been working on. Sorry, uh, Doctor. We, uh, we can listen to. You can listen. Yeah. Your microphone is closed. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, uh, some st students from mechatronics uh, are here in the auditorium. And because you are working on this topic, discrete event systems, automatas, and petrinets, color petrinets, and, and now you are analyzing default detections in, in this, uh, with this approach. Uh, can you say something about the applications? Because uh, 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 here in your diagrams, it can be seen, so apparently it seems uh, easy, but for realistic applications, like you say, transport systems, communication systems, uh, manufacturing, uh, uh, etc. The, 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 the real situation is uh, complexity computationally. So have you implemented on real applications, or realistic applications, and, and, and some PC or some computer machine, or some, or some, or some uh, software? How do you do that? Yeah, I'm going to go back to this uh, slide. Okay, to this slide. Um, here, our problem in this area is to build a diagnoser or to build an algorithms that uh, works in polynomial time. So this is the idea. For example, if you use, the, use this tool that is uh, an automata, then you will find that all your algorithms runs in polynomial time. But the problem here is that the space that you require to represent this system is uh, too large. For example, uh, this, this amount. And this is a small problem, a system that has uh, 70 machines, really a small one. So most of the time, uh, you cannot use this tool because your, your systems are so, big, uh, have, have so big or are bigger than this one. Maybe you go to an uh, factory that has uh, 200 of machines, so it's impossible to use this. So our problem here uh, is uh, to detect uh, these faults or to solve these problems, but in polynomial time. And in order to do that, we, we must pay attention to the structure of the net, to some properties that has this graph. For example, 
the invariance of the graph that are the uh, uh, left kernel and right kernel of this matrix for also to traps, also to uh, siphons, also to problematic change of choice on pairs, etc. That can be computed polynomial in polynomial time and to take advantage of this information in order to introduce this in the fault detection, in the observability, in the controllability, in such a way that uh, we obtain polynomial algorithms. And once we have a polynomial characterization of the problem, then it can be uh, deployed, it can be programmed in any computer, because uh, since it is poly polynomial, it's run in a very short time, demanding uh, not so much uh, resources from the nets. So that's the main idea here. Yeah. Even if the system is complex, you need to take uh, to you need to leverage uh, these petri nets, the information of these petri nets, to reduce the amount of computation that you require require to do in order to solve your problem. Yeah. No, I, I don't know if I am answering the question. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Este, there are another question for Dr. Antonio Ramirez. I, I have a question. Este, it's only a little point in the slide 33. Mm. 23 or 33? 33. Here, este, you say us if all the fault belong to the subtraction, this part, then the mm -hmm. system is diagnosticable. Uh, is an 100% diagnosticable or in what percentage? Okay. Uh, this is a very strong condition, as I told you. Uh, this is a sufficient condition. If there exists this kind of part and the fault belongs to this kind of, uh, of parts, then I can compute the fault. But if the fault doesn't belong to this kind of parts, then we don't know how to compute it. We don't know if the system is that diagnosable or not, because um, we don't, uh, well, the characterization is not complete. We are only given some sufficient conditions, but not a uh, necessary conditions. Yeah. So maybe there exist other cases where the faults belongs to a path where the, this transition has more than one input, and we still uh, can detect these faults. But there is not a, a characterization for this case. Uh, we analyze only this, this uh, every case in particular, but we don't have a, like a theory to solve them. Yeah. And how many cases uh, deals in this case or belongs to this case and the others? Okay, I don't know. I for sure that there exists uh, an infinite number of cases uh, where uh, look uh, that looks like this, but also there exists an infinite number of cases that belong to the other case. So we need to work a lot. Okay, I understand. Thank you very much. Well. Anyone have a uh, more question for Dr. Antonio? Well, if not, uh, thank Antonio. you. Do you have okay. Uh, I was remember some years ago, uh, because we have seen here some uh, engineering project section. Some years ago, uh, the Mexico City government asked uh, to to model the drain system, which is uh, kilometers and kilometers here in Mexico City. And, and, and of course, the, the idea or the problem was to, 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 to implement some fault diagnosis uh, because, uh, you know, it's quite complex, the, the, this network. And we think on applying petri nets, uh, it would be that possible. That case? Yeah. Yeah, I think it is possible. It's uh, very possible to use a uh, petri net to model all the subway railroads <laughs> to the network of the this, and also to introduce some security problem there because uh, we can warranty with these petri nets uh, that uh, there exists some uh, space between each uh, 
frames. So, and for us, it's uh, possible to detect all the faults that could occur during in this in the operation of these uh, frames. So, the, yes, the answer is uh, yes. It is very possible to use this tool to the system and to introduce unsafe conditions in the system and to detect the fault. Thank you very much, Antonio. Thank you very much. There are no other questions. Well, if not, este, thank you, este, Dr. Antonio Ramirez Treviño, for, for your presentation. Uh, thank you all for attending this plenary talk presented presented by Antonio Ramirez Treviño. And we invite you to continue attending the following activities in the International Congress CCE 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to you all. Thank you. Thank you. To, in, as in the name of the CCE 2022, uh, we thank you very much for your collaboration with this uh, interesting plenary lecture because you are an expert because the 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 the, the only expert in Mexico <laughs> dealing with this kind of topic. Uh, uh, so thank you very much uh, for collaborate for your collaboration uh, with the conference. Thank you, Susana. Thank you. Thank you. So so we thank you. <laughs>